Oh, hi. I want to welcome you guys to my YouTube channel. This is uh, Steve coming back with another video here. Just got caught up with my book there. So, what I'm going to show you in this video is a little sprite animation example I created. And the whole point of this video is actually to show you that there's a way that you can actually load and save your screens. So what this is useful for, and I did this on my original quest uh, for the Mad Bomber game on the Load Star issue that I sold back in 1995. This is actually good is if you want to create like Axie art or whatever and you know plot it on your screen with your keyboard or whatever and then basically save it. Um, now I had created a program originally called Game Master's Toolkit on the original Commodore 64 and maybe one of these days I'll be able to show it to you if I ever get my when I get my Commodore 64 back which is coming very soon and get a video capture card so I can show you that because actually you know porting the program over would take much more time. So anyways, I wanted to show you this, so it's going to show you how to load and save screens. It's, I think it's uh, pretty cool stuff. It actually speeds up the time normally if you had to sit there and draw stuff to screen memory and whatever. It's, it's a little bit faster, so let's get started on that. Okay, so we're back, and you can see the um, program running here in the background. I have a little bit of sprite animation going on, some new sprites that I had created, and basically this is the load and screen save application I was talking about. So I'm going to go ahead and activate it here, and I'm going to go ahead and press the L key. It's going to pause as the sprite is moving across the screen while it's loading the screen. It's going to load in the new screen that I created earlier. So it's pausing now. You see it's going to kind of replace everything. It's pulling in screen memory. And there's the new screen. And it also remembers everything even that you had typed on the screen originally. So it's very precise in what it does. I'm going to improve it a little bit better later so that I can sit there and save just the screen data, not save like stuff like this on the screen. This was because I saved it as I broke out of the program. I was having some problems to get it saved. But yeah, I thought I would show that to you. And let's go ahead and have a look at the code. Now, before we do this, um, let me um, reopen. Let me pause for a second. I'm going to reopen this in another uh, vice and show you the original load program. Okay, so we're back. Um, now, this is the original program that actually loads in this program, and I'll explain why in a minute. What this does is just uh, create some uh, place where we can actually safely load in the file here, and you'll see where it says, if you can kind of read here through line by line. This first line right here says DB equals peak 186. Um, this is basically looking for the drive, and this is a technique that was used by Lodestar back in the days, because some people used uh, different types of devices, and not everybody had a device 8. So it's going to safely pick up the device number. Um, this is just basically loading. This is creating um, a string for the, the quote sign. This is going to basically create something like this on the screen if I had to reproduce it. So it draws that on the screen and this DB would be replaced by the 8 there. And it basically it positions it back here on top of the L as it's loading the program to rerun the new file basically. And this one right here is just telling the, the name of the file we're going to load. This is just some positioning I did for the Y and the X. Um, so this peak 2 equals 11. I'm not sure what that was for. Something I got this from original code back in the day. But this basically finds the file name Movie Sprites and it sets it up to load it on the screen. And you can see the load is right here. And here's, here's I probably need to remove that. I probably don't need line 60 actually. But anyways, um, this is where it does a special load. And you see it passes in the Q strings. These are the two quotes um, for the. This is what you see. It's right. If you had to sit there and do it like this, for example, print to show you that Q string. So CHR strings 34. You'll see it puts a quote on the screen. So essentially, it's all it's doing is it's creating those two quotes to get the load set up. And then it also creates a run right underneath it. So it strategically sets it up to load asterisk. So basically, it does something like this: load. And I'm just showing you behind the scenes because you can't see it when it's actually running. And I'll run it here in just a second. It does something like that. And then underneath here, after it hits the ready, after you load it, it'll have run. And it automatically reruns the, the new program. And that's essentially what those two lines are doing right there. And then this next line just puts a message on the screen, shows it's going to be loading it in. This is just a positioning of the, the cursor to position the text on the screen. Now this line right here is interesting. Line uh, 130 is actually setting up the pointers for where we're going to be loading it. 
But line 44 is interesting, though. If you look at line 44, oops. Actually, I'm going to have to pause there so I can actually. Okay, I'm back. Um, so where we left off here is I was going to show you this line that I accidentally ran the program earlier. So excuse me on that. So 140, you see the poke 44 comma 20. And essentially what this is doing is it's moving uh, the basic pointer around in memory so that basic is now pointing to 5120 as you see there on this poke uh, 20. Now the way to calculate that is to go like this. Take the low byte, 0, the high byte, 44, or I'm sorry, 20. And then you're going to multiply it by 256 to get 5120. And this just sets up the, the pointer safely. So just going to read a little bit more on that. But essentially, that memory location is known as the pointer to the start of basic program text. So this allows me, the reason why I did this, guys, is because I wanted to relocate my um, character set in a different area and also my sprites. Now, if you don't do that and you try to set, for example, set your sprites starting at somewhere like 828, which is a, a common place to, um, why can't I find that today? Well, anyways, I was trying to find the colon, but anyways, 828. 828 is usually the start of sprite memory and if you don't do that for example then it I mean if you set them to 828 keep in mind that each one is 64 bytes so if we take 828 divided by 64 it tells me oops I just created a line for that didn't mean to do that 828 divided by 64 it tells us um, what well, tells us how much room we have um, so if we take the 828 is it 828 times 12 I'm doing this right 9936. So anyways, my calculations off. What I was trying to do is I was trying to calculate where the start of memory would be for each sprite. But individually, what's going on here is you're going to basically, according to the map in the Atari book, memory locations 828 is where a lot of people can put like start of sprites in memory, for example. But if you go too far beyond a certain point, and I'll show you in a book here in just a second, it's going to eventually run into the screen. It's going to overlap the data and stuff like that. So... Let me just minimize this for a second. So do I want to just show you this book right here. If you can see this memory location right there, it shows 828 right there. 828 to 1,094. So if you go over 1,019, you hit into 1,024, you're going to hit into screen memory, and your sprites are going to start overtaking the screen. So basically, as you're trying to poke into 1,024, it's poking into the screen instead of poking into the sprites. So essentially, what I did is I moved the sprites. By moving memory, I started basic at a different area that doesn't allow my sprites to run into the screen and also allows more rooms to have a larger character set. So this is a common technique that is done on a lot of programs. And so what I'll do is I'll run this. Hopefully it'll work here. And it should load. And it's going to basically move basic to the um, starting screen memory of 5120 and successfully pick up the sprites and... Um, the redefined characters, the character set. So it's just loading in my regular program here. And you can see it's loaded in the sprites here, just like before. And we got the background character, and there's no interference be between either of them. And to show you this, I have more than just these sprites. So I'm going to show you on the screen here real quick by going down here and peek it into, let me just see where they start at. Actually, I think I know. I think they start at 195, is it? Yeah, there's one right there. You can see, if you remember my game Space Doubt, that's the, one of the dragons. There's the other one. Might have more in there than that. Let me see, 190 maybe? Let's see where they start at. 192, there's a 192. Let's see, there's a 191. There's no one. So they start at 192, essentially. So I put them at 192 there. 193. You can just see these are the different sprites. And eventually these would run into the screen memory, but they're not going to be able to do it here because I safely moved them all out of the way. So we have plenty of room for plenty of sprites. I was going to show you them all as I go through them. It might take a moment to go through them here, but I wanted to show you them. They're all here. Let me pause a second. Okay, so I loaded up the sprite pad that I had created here. And you can see these are all the characters. And I'm going to go back here to the example here and show you. 
you can see the next one. So this is 198 right here. And then 199 should be that little alien guy we had before. Oh, actually, that was that one. And that's that one, excuse me. So we go back here. There he is. You see a little skinny little alien there. He's in different colors because I have different colors set for the sprites. But you can see as I'm going through them that they're changing. And there's the one that's laying down. Pretty soon we'll be at the other guy. There's the other guy. So now we're looking at this sprite right here. And you see as I'm going through. Now he's in green too because this is on a different sprite. And I have colors set differently for a sprite 1 versus sprite 0. You see all the sprites are there. And essentially all I did is I just cycled through all those sprites. And that was the last one. So that's how you, um, the reason why I was showing you that is that's why I had moved memory. Otherwise by now we would already clashed into the screen memory up here. Since it's, if you started at 828 eventually, you're going to run out of screen memory here. So if I had, um, I was trying to calculate that earlier with enough greatest of calculations, but let me see. So if we took uh, 1024 and subtracted that from 828, and that's 196 divided by 64. So 196, I think that would be the number of, um, let's see, 64, 196 divided by 64. I was trying to see if I could calculate this. So it takes up 64, maybe I'm using the wrong, maybe it's not 64. I was trying to figure out how much memory that would be. So if you take 1024, that's where it runs in the screen memory, subtract it from 828, that's um, 196 bytes. But then um, that you have room before you run into essentially screen memory. So basically that three was actually saying I could probably put in three sprites. So eventually we would hit three here and we would start running into screen memory. So we would never see the next sprite load into memory. Instead we'd see the screen memory start poking in since that's the next area of memory it would be hitting. So even if we moved them to another area of memory like 12288, then we wouldn't have any room for the character set. So it's kind of all the same thing here. So let's go ahead and have a look at the code here. I'm sure you've been aching to see that. Okay, so I still got the character set on. I need to turn it back off here. Okay, you can see um, the first line I'm doing right here. Now, I didn't explain this. Do you see this movie sprites 2, comma 8, 780? Let's take that line and look at that line. This is essentially loading in the background. So earlier, I'm sorry, not the background. This is loading in. This is loading in. I believe it's uh, the sprite. Yeah, the sprites. So I had saved these in. Um, I'll show you another tool here. I had to locate the tool. So this is a tool that I'm using. It's called DB64 Editor. And thanks to Bo originally showing me about this tool when we looked it up a couple of years ago. What this does is it allows you to create your own D64 files and then when you have like a sprite file saved here for example, like if I go here to save project, you'll see the sprite file here is uh, sprites 3. This is the last one I saved as of today. This one, you can drag that file into here and you can start creating your own D64 file. Or you can just go in here and you can click on, I think it's save. Oh, actually we don't have to open it. I think we have to open it and we'd have to locate like a D64 file. And then it'll appear, it'll show all the files here, and then you just drag in the sprite images, and it, once you hit that save button, it merges them together. So that's a way to get your sprite data included in with your um, D64 files. So hopefully that didn't confuse you too much. So basically, you can't just go in here and you can't save this to a D64 file because it, it won't let you do that. So that's what this is doing. Once we save them, it locates that file now that we have that new movie sprites too copied here. So if I went in here and I just, for example, said, and I called this uh, movie sprites, and actually there it is, movie sprites. Actually, I was looking all over for it, and here it is. I couldn't remember the name I called it. It was movie sprites. I see it there. So I think it's just remembering my last things I typed in. So movie sprites, that's what it's doing. It's remembering some other files. So if I just typed in movie sprites 2, 
for example, like that. Then if I save this here, which I could, it'll basically allow me to drag that file into the D64 so we can load it into the project. And you see it right there. So this is basically now we're going to have to merge it in with this D64 file. And that's what that tool is all about. So that's just basically loading in the sprites that we saved in from here. Now, why is that possible? The reason why I did this way, otherwise you have to read in the sprites and the data statements, and it'll take that much longer just to kind of read them in. It slows the program down. So when I originally did this with uh, Quest for the Mad Bomber, it just saved a lot of loading time. Instead of, you know, now loading time, but saved a lot of initialization and waiting for the program to essentially load. And that was pretty massive. That program had done a lot of different things in it. A lot of machine calls, so I, I could have probably shortened it more, but I was running out of time. Anyways, that's what that line's doing right there. So let's take a look at the next part. The next parts here should be common by now. This is um this 53270 comma peak. What this is doing is it's activating the multicolor mode for the, the the background characters here. So I might have it still on here. Let's see it. I go like that and initialize it right there. And if I set the color, you'll see it's still got the, um, the multicolor activated. So that's essentially what that's doing. If you don't see how the, the text looks like that, that's because that's text is in multicolor. So I just use Control Tab to change the color to something that's standard mode, which I showed in the other video before, and then you can read it easier. So the next lines here, these are some ghost subs. Oops, I skipped them there. So let's look at line 60. Ghost of 1000. These are just some setups we're doing. Remember, the ghost subs is going to return back to that routine. This is initializing the screen. You can see here it's changing the border, the black. It's changing the screen to black, and it's setting up the sprite colors. That's what these are for. And this read x equals 0 to 57. This is reading in um, what's called basically my character set um, moving movement because you have to move it from it's sitting in ROM. So you have to move all that character set. You remember the character set, for example, are all like these letters like this, for example. All of these are contained in your computer's memory in what's called pet axis. And it moves them into an area in RAM so you can start writing over your redefined characters. And I explained that in the very basic tutorial 9, I think it was, the last video I posted. So go ahead and watch that video if you haven't. There's a lot of good information in it as we're moving forward. And that's what that does. It just redefines the character set um, in a safer area so we can play with it. And this next line right here is going to change the characters. So if we wanted to go in here, we could add some new lines. And if you want me to, I'll show you how to do that. I don't know if I explained that in the last video, but let me show you that. Okay, so I've isolated some lines here to show you um, we were talking about earlier um, right here. This character set, this is 2048. This is where we're going to begin our character set. And if we see this plus A, and we look at the data lines here, which I should have probably brought these on the screen. Actually, let me just do this again. So, so the line we're going to look at would be 2050, for example. Okay, so I'm going to use this as an example. So we're going to turn the character set back on with this special quote. And if we hit the number sign, you'll see that there's a brick wall there. Now, earlier I went in and I changed it. Now I'm going to show you why it looks a little bit different the way it does now. So what we're going to do is if you see this right here, I'm going to move this up on the screen here. I hope you can see this. You see this character right here? I mean, this is um, a redefined character. We're going to go ahead and change it to this real time as we're looking at it right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically figure out where in memory that is. If you see this, um, let me just turn off the character set again so you can kind of read these lines again. You see this line here, 2048 plus 8 times 8. What it's doing is it's reading in A, so it's reading in the first letter or first number here of 35. And it is adding that times 8. So if we go here, for example, and we want to calculate it, we would, and I'm just going to put it up here so it doesn't go off the screen, we would just say 2048 plus 35 times 8. And that's the safe area where we can start screen memory there. So let's turn on the character set again. And we'll begin playing with it. So we already know we've already got the new memory location, which starts at 2328. I'm going to make a note just for myself. So let's go ahead and start playing with that now. So we're going to change 2328 and the first number we have here 
is 255. So watch when real carefully what happens when I hit enter. You'll see this. You should see this top of this ball change. Oh, actually, I printed. I forgot to poke it. <laughs> that is a bad habit of wanting to print and poke all the time. So 283, 28, 255. You see how that drew that line right on top of there? So what it's doing in real time is it's changing the character set real time. So all we have to do is hit the next byte in row, which is 255, and the next value is 159. So you're going to see it change as I'm going through each byte. It's starting to look like our character a little bit. It's 243. Looks good enough. And then we got 255. There's two of those in a row. You can see how it's changing in real time. We're almost done. 159. And then 255, and we're done. So now we've created our totally new character for the one we saw earlier. And that's what this line is doing, is it's going into the where the character set has been moved to, which starts at position uh, for the, the number sign. Remember, if we go back here and we set this to 21 again, you'll see it's that number sign right there that we redefined. And this character set is just pointing to where the character set is in memory. So it's pointing into 2048 where it's being initialized. And you just saw it change real time. That's basically all we're doing is we're changing it real time. So we could go and add it into the code if we wanted to and create this as a new line, for example. Let's just say we wanted to change that brick wall. To be on the safe side here, I'm going to go ahead and save this line so I can put it back the way it was. Just set a remark so I can always come back and change it. And in 2050, we're going to add in our new data here. Right, make sure, always make sure you start with the number too. So 35, and I'll just type in the rest here. And see if I left the 25 in, it would be a central mistake. And essentially, it would have just changed it to whatever this 25 would have been. It would look like that. It's actually kind of interesting. Let's leave it like that for a second. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change that first one to a 25 and leave the last one to a 255. Kind of give it a rounded effect on the wall. That's kind of interesting. Now when we run it, we'll get to see the new data here in a second. And the wall would look totally different. See? Looks totally different now than it did before. So that's what we did is we changed the wall. Now you know how to do that. Turn the character set off again. And hide the sprites with this value right here. And then we'll just go back to our new lines. And then what we've done is we've hit return after we've initialized the character set. We go to 1020, which goes back here. But as soon as it hits a negative 1 in the data as we're reading it, it just returns and goes back to the next go sub. So we started off at this 1000. Now we're at 1110. And we'll see what that one does. This one's doing initialization for the sprites. So this is setting up the screen memory for where the sprites are going to start, 53248. And then here, these values here, we'll go over these later. Um, essentially, this is just setting up the enabling the sprite, setting up all sprites to be enabled. And here, we're setting up the, um, some of the different values in memory, like the, um, I don't know what these numbers are, by I'd have to go in here to do something like this just to see what it is. Um, it's probably the um, 53276, the memory, so we can position them on the screen. And that's all it's doing is just initializing them, setting up the colors for the sprites. So the next go sub is uh, 520. We'll look at that one. This just draws the stars. If you remember from the very basic tutorial, this draws those random stars on the screen, sets the Y position and all that. Okay, so now that we're done with the go subs, we've already we've gone back here. As I showed you, this line is redefining. I'm setting up the multicolor mode. Um, so if you wanted to see multicolor mode turned off, for example, uh, I'll show you right here. I'll, I'll just set this text so you can see the multicolor mode again. We just go poke 53, 270, comma 200, and it turns it off like that. Now it's all in regular mode again. You might notice it looks a little bit different. Okay, so what we got next here is that we're just basically drawing the wall on the screen and all that. So the reason why I was showing you this originally about saving the screen memory is you wouldn't have to do all these pokes. 
once you're able to save the screen locations, it saves you having to poke everything to the screen and position the characters and, and such for it. And plus, if you're doing an entire screen, it can take a long time to sit there and draw it, as you've seen from my very first tutorial example. Okay, so once we've done with all that, we go here and we get the keyboard. If you remember the program, it allows you to save and load the screen. And I demonstrated that at the very beginning. This is uh, using the S key for the keyboard to save the screen. It's going to line 1410. If you wanted to look at it, you'll see that that's the save routine. And this is a save routine I used from originally Lodestar. Um, this is just how they go in and they save. This is the screen memory right here. And this is just setting up the pointers for where it's going to save. Now, these pointers are not probably what they're going to appear to be since we moved the memory around. So actually it is 54272. So this is actually setting up the, the screen memory, color memory. And then this other one is 120, 120 plus 4 times 256. Yeah, that's what it is. So this one is actually, I have these backward. Actually, this is not color memory. This is actually screen memory. This is screen memory. And then the other one is color memory at the top there. We'll just change that one. This is the color memory. I think I had to reverse them for a reason. Anyways, this line is setting up the color memory now that we successfully calculated it. And this is the screen memory. It's just a formula that is used um, inside of a, a machine language routine. It's a, you can use this in your code without even setting up you know, your own machine language code. It'll, it's already built into the Commodore 64. So that's kind of cool. So that allows you to save. So if you always use this one, you'll be able to save the screen memory. And you want to save the file. Now when you're saving it, always use this. Um, you see this at DB. Remember, this is just a device. So essentially all this is saying is just at 0, like that. I'm saying the device, I'm sorry. This is just basically replacing this file. You use the at 0, it replaces it. And then you set the CM, and that's going to allow you to replace that over and over again. And I just set the DV because of Lodestar's uh, technique to do it by you know, initializing multiple devices. So the next one here is load. kind of does the reverse. And you can go back here once again, and you can probably play with these high and low byte values. And that's for the 780. This is the low byte, and this is the high byte to figure out where it's pointing to in memory. I think it's called a vector. 3720. Probably not sure why that's showing that. Let me see, 781, 782. Probably have them reversed again or something. Let's see, 0 and 120. Anyways, it, this is how it, these are always going to work for the memory, but whatever. So we move, here's where we're going to basically move our character. You saw the animation going on the screen here. And this is where it all happens. And I just skipped another line I need to show you here. This line above here says x equals x plus dr. This dr is initially set to 1, so that it moves the character over the screen. And that's what these lines are doing right here. It's saying if the sprite has reached character position 200, and I originally changed this to 255 or 252. So if he reaches position 252, then we're going to flip the, the direction to a negative 1. So this will make him start walking backwards. And this is saying if he's the greater than 252, then we're going to also point to the new sprite. So this is saying, where does the new sprite begin? He starts at position 209 in memory location 2040, 2041 right here. And it takes that value once it finds it and pokes it into the character. And this is constantly poking into the 2041, the sprite shape, so we can see the animation going on. You saw me demonstrate that earlier. And then this right here is getting the high, high byte, so we know how far. And this is basically what this line does right here. If you see underneath here, um, just ignore this one for now. But you see it says ghost of 500, and then after that it does the, the sprite shape. So this is just saying if the sprite position is reaching a 2 every time, every time it counts to a 2, then it's going to keep incrementing that pointer. This is a way to kind of slow down the animation. So the sprite, you can actually see the movement of the sprite. If I don't put this line in there, then he's going to be moving very quickly. And you won't see the, the motion won't be smooth. So that kind of smooths out the motion there. And this just sets the sprite high. So S high is for the sprite high. 
So Sprite High picks up this first line since the first time we're moving across the screen, you see him walking across the screen. Then he's going to wait till he hits 252 and then he's going to reverse them. This one here is doing the reverse. So it's saying once he walks all the way back over here to the left, he's at position 40. Then it's going to flip him back to a positive motion again and get him going back in the same direction again. And it's going to point to the sprite that's moving in that direction. So essentially what those lines are doing is just allowing the animation to take place. And I think I showed you everything else. Everything else is just the ghost subs we went to, setting up the sprites, the color memory. And of course down here is all the data. This is the machine language data on top of it. And then below that is the, the sprite character memory. Well, it was a long one. <laughs> so I hope you guys had some fun with this. We'll go ahead and rerun it one more time just for entertainment purposes. And I'll load in the screen again. Okay, you see the animation going on? That's just changing that 2041. And it's just changing through each individual shape with that P2 equals P2 plus 1. And his movement is walking all the way over here until he hits position 252. Then that DV is going to reverse him and send him back in the other direction. And if we hit the L key here, if this is the right file, it should load in the other map. You always hear a funny noise when it loads it. And there it is. You can see, it remembered everything that was on the screen from originally. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And I'd like to hear your feedback and comments on what you thought about this one. And if there was anything confusing, let me know. I'll go ahead, and, as always, and I'll upload this eventually to GitHub. And I'll try to put the link in the description here so you can see that. And, yeah, I appreciate your likes, uh, favorites, subscribe, sharing this video, and trying to grow this channel more and more. I've got so many more exciting things coming for you. I'm going to be working on, I'm going to hopefully be working on soon, some Sprite movies. And it's going to be kind of like little funny scenes, kind of like you saw with the Halloween example. Um, just setting up some kind of maybe some humor in it or something. So we'll see how that goes, and we'll play it by ear as we go along. So thanks for watching, guys.